it's, it's a pleasure to be here. First of all, apologies if I didn't join from the morning. Our waiting lists are horrible, and today is a clinic day, so, it's, so the lunch break worked, but I couldn't cancel the entire clinic. Um, okay, so musculoskeletal conditions. There are, here, are, these are data for public health England, and musculoskeletal conditions are a growing problem in UK like in the rest of the world. The reason is that there is a good part of musculoskeletal condition, you would see that they are directly linked to age. And so there is a growing need of stratifying approaches to improve musculoskeletal health in the aging population. Uh, if you look at numbers, they're quite impressive. 20% of people in UK have the see a doctor is for an MSK related condition. So that's the dimension of musculoskeletal altogether. Five billion each year is the cost. Now, musculoskeletal condition, besides the access to GP and besides the sheer cost, are also a major driver of disability. And in the quality of life adjustment of the, of, of the NHS, the year spent disabled are an important uh, cost element. Uh, I'm no health economist, but I learned that this DALI is the, uh, it's, it's an element to consider in any evaluation of, of cost effectiveness for a new diagnostic or therapeutic uh, intervention. And musculoskeletal condition are the first cause of disability. Now, this is the breakdown of musculoskeletal. We call them MSK. Uh, but they're a very heterogeneous group of conditions. 90%, which is all the pie chart, uh, I don't have a pointer here, but it's all the pie chart with that is not exploded, are not inflammatory. And, and, and they're 90% of these 20 million yeah? um, people. And lower back pain is the big chunk. I, I reckon we are 35 here and uh, 15 to 20 will have a bit of lower back pain or had it, at least a couple of back flares. Uh, osteoarthritis is the other big chunk, is the blue part of the pie chart there. One out of two people that becomes wise enough to reach 50, they will have some osteoarthritis somewhere. Fibromyalgia is the purple and osteoporosis. So these are called non-inflammatory musculoskeletal condition. They are somehow related to what is known to be the wear and tear, yeah? Or meaning the aging of our uh, joints. And they are linked to um, disability, of course, but also to low exercise and high BMI. So interventions in these conditions are usually non pharmacological or actually the most effective intervention in, in lower back pain and, and in osteoarthritis and non-pharmacological. Of course, we have pharmacological intervention for fibromyalgia and osteoporosis. What I do for a living and what I will uh, concentrate on is on this 10%, which are the inflammatory conditions, yeah? Uh, altogether, vasculitis and uh, are in the CTDs, rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile arthritis, JA, axial spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, and gout. They take 10% of all, and these are data from restless arthritis. Now, if we want to classify these conditions in, in these three groups, you see, you see what is the main difference of the inflammatory conditions versus the, the, the condition of musculoskeletal pain and osteoporosis. The first thing you, you notice, as I mentioned, is that the condition of musculoskeletal pain are more common with rising age. And osteoporosis, of course, affect mainly people with older age, or some, or some cases in, for, for malnutrition. They have a gradual onset, and they are the most common one. Now, uh, you want, uh, you want, to, want to, to focus on this um, main treatment, and they are treated with physical activity for the condition of musculoskeletal pain, and uh, whereas for osteoporosis, of course, there is a pharmacological intervention. I will not speak further of this, but the opportunity for people that would be interested in remote diagnostic there is screening algorithm to detect pain and to trigger the interventions. These are nice validated algorithm that advanced practitioners do in now in GP practices, because of course, being this 20% of all access to GP, GP practices have learned to devolve 
this access to advanced practitioners. And this come from every background, from nursing background, from pharmacist background, and they have to apply very well validated, nice algorithms. So this, there is room for remote screening and trigger intervention there. And uh, it has been done a bit with the pandemic, but there is still so much to, to, to be done. Uh, before going into the, the condition, it's, it's always good to look at numbers because of course they give us the dimension of the problem. But when you see patients on the other side of the desk, any of these conditions can affect life quite deeply. So it is important on one side to have a full health economic evaluation. On the other side, we might risk to disregard the, the issues that affect the individuals, right? And so I will focus on inflammatory conditions. They, they start to affect people in a lot younger age. This is an example of Ben has a juvenile arthritis. There are only 12,000 children in the UK with juvenile arthritis. But the diagnostic delay is around two to three years. And two years at 12 years of age, it's almost 20% of your life. So it is in the opportunity for all inflammatory musculoskeletal conditions is the early detection and remote diagnostic will, would help a lot. So younger year, age of onset, high morbidity and hospital access. So while they are only 10% of that cake, they are responsible for a very high morbidity rate. The most severe of these conditions, scleroderma, which is the one that I focus on, has a 55% disability and loss of work um, within eight years from diagnosis. Yeah. Reduced life expectancy, and altogether they have a high lifetime cost, which is dictated by two elements. First is the disability, and the second is that we treat them with high cost drugs. And since they happen in, the, in, in, in teenage, the drug for juvenile idiopathic arthritis is still 9,000 pounds a year. And luckily, Ben now has a life expectancy that is around 65 or 70, so he's reduced, but it will be 60 years of his life on a 9,000 pounds a year drug. So what is the opportunity? So I was mentioning this, these drugs, they, uh, these conditions are treated with drugs, they may be high cost. There is a growing number of effective disease modifying agent. This is this DMAR that you see in the center. They are coming out of patent and they are becoming a lot more accessible. So the, the health economic scenario of treating this condition will be changing in, in the next decade. But today, in average, they cost anything between three and 25,000 pounds per patient per year. And so the opportunities around this intervention are early detection, not because we want to start to use high cost drug earlier, but because there's one thing that is well recognized is that early intervention in these conditions that happen to harm the <coughs> joints and the internal organs are linked to better outcome. Uh, remote mo and a remote monitoring. We, with the advance in, in biologic treatment, we're able to achieve remission in, in average 50 to 60% of our patients, right? Of course, this varies from disease in disease. And these patients are fairly stable and they need just normal monitoring every year. And we, we would be able to monitor them with a normal blood test and a questionnaire. So that is the other opportunity. And uh, detection of no response of high cost drugs. Today, I was saying 60% of patients re reach a remission in average, but there is a 20% of patients that doesn't respond. And these patients tend to remain on the wrong high cost drug for all the time the NHS needs to see them. So detection of non-response will, will increase the effectiveness of the way we use the drug. And of course, postcode inequalities, if you happen to be in Leeds, you have a CTD excellent center where we see patients with in a, in a multidisciplinary team and we have good experience of all these high cost drugs. If you happen to be in Whitby or in Burlington, the average delay to access the high cost drug is two years more than a patient in Leeds. So there is this deep cost inequality. The NHS rightly so took as a mission 
to, to abolish this. And remote diagnostic, of course, will have a prime uh, opportunity. Now, an example of how this could translate in a condition. This is the disease I deal with. It's called scleroderma. Uh, we don't need to go into detail of the disease, but in this disease continuum, you see, in, in the bottom you see time, patients start with a very common symptom, it's called Renault, and then eventually, thanks to some biomarkers, uh, ATA and ICA, we can do an early detection of these patients. And then there is a group of patients that will go more in the top here, in the red, and it, it, it will have a prevalently fibrotic damage, and these patients have bad skin and bad lung fibrosis. And a group of patients that has a different type of damage, vascular damage, and they have different drugs that we use, and they eventually will, will have high risk of developing PAH. Altogether, the, the life expectancy of these patients is reduced by 25% compared to, to, to the, the general population. And patients with the diffuse, they have only a 60% uh, chance of surviving 10 years of diagnosis. Yeah, so it is a severe condition. But the opportunities are in early detection in patients at risk, monitor and predict disease activity, and monitor response. And what applies to scleroderma applies to all inflammatory conditions. Some are extremely easy, like gout, right, for instance. Now, what do we do in each of these um, um, scenarios and what we could use today if we build the case. So I'm moving out from, from scleroderma now. We'll talk just about it later as a, uh, a case study. But you see, CRP is an inflammatory marker that most of you know. Uric acid and CK, they are not even immunological assay, they are biochemical assays, and they are the first point of diagnosis for a vast majority of patients with inflammatory condition. For polymyalgia aromatica to gout, to myositis, these are tests that pretty much make the diagnosis with a couple of clinical insights. Now, these tests, patients usually go to the GP and they need to be lucky enough to have that appointment. The GP appointment cost is 30 pounds and the test is less than 10 pounds. So having that test could spare altogether a GP appointment or it could make it a lot more, more, more effective. And then there is a second line of tests that you see, the RF, the ACPA, and the ANA. These are antibodies, rheumatoid factor, um, anti serotonin peptide antibodies, and ANA. They are validated tests too. They're very simple, and they're still done in an NHS setting. In the past two years, if I learned something, is that when there is an opportunity and there is the technology, we can do a remote diagnostic. You hear me with a cold, but I know I don't have COVID because I did it this morning in my bedroom, yeah? So, so this rheumatoid factor, ACPA and ANA, are prime opportunity for remote diagnostic. There, there will be a market research to be done, a business case, I mean, to create the, the, the case, really, but the technology, it is not an obstacle. And then, of course, there is the stratification for digital progression. This is what we do in the DRC. This is pretty much a research agenda. What can we add to this very common and simple to do test that can add in the efficiency we see patients? It might look very, uh, like a very small problem for the 10% uh, of the 10% of the musculoskeletal conditions, but this severe connective tissue disease are there by six places in the country. And so um, I have an 18 weeks waiting time for patients that are waiting to know whether their heart is involved by this condition, whether they need a, a drug, whether they need to go on disability. So the other two opportunities were monitor and predict disease activity and monitor response. Now, also in this case, there are some tests that are very simple. and. Look, they are the same. And this is a common, um, common factor that you will see in, uh, in um, musculoskeletal condition. Often enough, the test that leads to diagnosis is also a good test to monitor disease activity. And this is true for gout. Uh, this is true for uh, PMR, so C CRP, uric acid. And then what most of the drugs that we use effectively in this condition may have some side effects and may need monitoring. Very simple monitor, liver function test. And these patients still need to come off of their houses, go 
to a GP practice or to our hospital and have that test checked, whereas they could do it simply at home. Same goes for hemoglobin and creatine kinase. Slightly more complicated, but they're not bio, um, just bio, uh, biochemical assays, but they are antibody mediated assays at the complement levels and the double strand DNA, but also this is nothing more than a lateral flow yeah, uh, test. And what this test, if this test were devolved to a remote care, what would be the gain? The gain would be to improve the annual review performance. We could triage patients that need annual review according to a test that they can tell us and, and, uh, through their, their phone and send it to our electronic health record. And this would increase the efficiency of access to the, to the NHS. And of course, um, in this sense, it's complemented the telemedicine. Now, I borrowed this slide from, from my uh, few years ago, and this is the dangerous journey of biomarkers to become tests, right? Uh, he told me that it was in average 17 years. I couldn't put the reference because I forgot, but you'll ask Mike. But if you look just at the condition that I, I specialize in scleroderma, at the end of 2021, there were 1,800 published papers on different biomarkers. And we still have the same biomarkers we had in, uh, the same diagnostic test we had in the 80s. So uh, there was a very interesting review on Lancet saying that the biomarker science has been an extremely wasteful science because there have been a, a lot of very interesting publications that led to a paper and nothing else. And so that journey there, it's where most of the biomarkers fall down. And I would like to share the journey that we've been doing here for, for, uh, for scleroderma as a case study. And um, we have been focusing on uh, interfer type 1 interferon, which we know is involved in, in this disease and is, is produced mainly in the target organ. You see that lightening there that uh, struck the skin. So, there is an injury which we don't need to go in, in detail, but interferon, type 1 interferon, which is the first line of response against viruses, is also triggering this autoimmune disease. And of course, we measure interferon through the genes uh, that are um, uh, induced by interferon in the skin. Some of these are for soluble proteins that then go in the blood, and we can measure those proteins in the blood. Now, we have done a, a um, health economic study on the, the first 200 samples that we have tested because we have found that measuring this interferon would increase the chances of patients progressing in that disease continuum, in, in, in this case from, from having just renal as a symptom to having a non-renal symptom, so early detection of disease. And you see that patients that were positive according to this threshold had a 50, 40, 48% chance of not having the disease rather than 85. So we have done, oh, this is a video. If you can click on it and, and make it start. This is the, the case study we, we have done it a while ago. There you go. You see here on the, on the left are patients that are coming to my clinic without this interference score. And on the right is the simulation of, of the same patients that if tested negative, they go back up to the GP and if tested positive, they come. So you see that the, the waiting list would be reduced, the number of, of visits they need to do to be diagnosed is reduced, and altogether, less patients will go back at the end of the three-year journey to the GP without diagnosis. So if you count all of that, how many appointments would be saved against the cost of the study, firm, they told me, for this 100 patient, would the cost would have been 73,000, instead with the interferon score, would be 27,300. So that was the first part of the, of the, um, of the health economic analysis we've done with Natimis, a company that was here in Leeds. Now, of course, since then, we're measuring interferon score a lot. Uh, we have almost 800 patients now, and we're looking at how this is changing over time. And since we were convinced of the potential of this test, we started a different science that it was completely new to me of this analytical validation to bring this biomarker to diagnostics. And so looking at accuracy in different concentration range, things that were always over my head. So I hope we are in the second part of this bridge for this test. Also because I don't have 17 more years to spend on this, I don't plan to. 
So, but why did I talk about that? Because while this is going, we started, and aware of the fact that it may take so many years, to think of a remote diagnostic for this interferon. This interferon uh, test at the moment is a, is a luminex-based assay, right? So simple blood test that needs to go uh, to a lab and have it done. But when we th did the, the, the first uh, meeting with patients, they say, very good. Let's say that this becomes a test. You can measure it every six months or every year and uh, you might miss a lot of what's happening in between. You know, today I feel bad, I call the, the helpline, I'm called back in 48 hours, and then you, and they, I tell, this is from the patients, right? They told us, if I feel bad today and I call the helpline, I receive a call, call a phone call back in 48 hours. They, they talk with me and they realize they need to speak with you, doctor, and so then you call me back after three or four days, and some of my symptoms are gone, and, and some have been worsened, and then you book me for an appointment, and then it's 12 weeks, and then I have this interference score test. Doesn't make sense. If you want to do it right, do it that I can measure it all the time. And so we, we participated to a sandpit that was uh, sponsored by the DPSRC with the in Imperial College, and we received this grant to have a um, diagnostic that is based on micro needles, and that's the fly there. Yeah, that's the mosquito. Um, what what is about? The aim is is the same. You've seen this part, and so it is. The literature in this condition has shown that the culprit of the disease is in the skin, and when and measuring activity in the skin will give a very good idea of how active is the disease. And the gold standard at the moment is this suction blister. So this is a vacuum pump applied to a plastic cup that actually takes out of the skin some fluid, and then we can measure biomarker if in that fluid. And when we look at these biomarkers, these are extremely important, and they correlate very well with the rest of the disease activity, proving that the skin is really the, 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 the place where this, this condition is, is, is brewed. Uh, but of course, this is a very much a research tool. When we asked patients, would you be happy to have that done in your, in your house? And these were the faces. These are our two of our PPI group. Yeah, and they say, not at all. So they say, uh, try it. And you see also here two different faces of scleroderma. These patients, of course, they agreed to be on the, on the presentation. Yeah? Uh, on, on, on the left, there is a young lady that you can see her, her teeth coming out because scleroderma has shrunk her, her lips. And the same thing is happening to her lungs and to her gut. On the, on the other side, there's a benign, mild scleroderma. This lady has been affected for 30 years with a bit of arthritis and some uh, gastrointestinal involvement, but not much. So there is a huge heterogeneity in this disease. And of course, when we involve patients, we try to take both ends of the spectrum. So that was the project. We are starting to do this, this um, microneedle now. We have four different models that are testing. And the project in this case, it's, oh, of course, they say if, if this was uh, they wanted to know what is microneedle because, of course, when you talk with patients, and that's another important point, it is great that we engage with patients, but sometimes it is also crucial the, type, the way we convey the message because uh, this uh, scientist said imperially had the idea of a mosquito, and patients said, I hate mosquitoes. <laughs> and I said, yes. I said, well, what I'm trying to say about the mosquito is that the needle that you get for a blood test it is 26 gauge, and the needle that is in the mosquito, which we will do in this microneedle, it is uh, 480. So look how small or smaller it is. You will not feel it. Ah, but don't call it mosquito because mosquitoes are annoying. And so if you record that feedback in the PPI engagement, they, you can sync the entire project. So it is important to convey the right message and also to filter the feedback, yeah? The feedback was not how, how big is the needle, right? because mosquitoes don't make me smile, they were saying. Okay, so um, what is the project at the moment? Uh, so these micro needles, we have three different types, and they are tested on skin that we take from surgical flaps, and we load the skin with these biomarkers artificially, and we measure how 
each of these models can, can pick up this, this bi biomarker in the most accurate way. And then, of course, the second part is to compare it on real skin biopsies. And actually, the University of Leeds is involved in the uh, MHRA application of, uh, to get this as to a device stage. But to say that when you really want to do something new, that, that's where the 17 years are, are from. This started three years ago, and hopefully I will see it before I retire. But anyway, so the, the purpose, of course, is that with a continuous monitoring, and this is actually how the, the microneedle looks like. Yeah, it's, it's very small and is also attached to a sensor and a chip that transmits to an app. Okay, and so you can monitor activity, you can decide whether the drug is working, you can decide whether that flare is because of scleroderma or is because of any other reason, right? And this is important at many levels, not only for patient management, but also for research. Uh, I'm just back from Glasgow where I got this bad cold, where there was a British Society of Rheumatology and the Hebert Oration, which is the big oration that uh, is, is done since Dr. Hebert, I don't know how we uh, uh, describe arthritis, yeah, osteoarthritis, um, founded the BSR. It was about genetics. And th the burden of correlating genetics with disease activity today is because we cannot measure disease activity. And so, a flare that is reported by a patient, we consider it a flare, but it might be not. It might be, uh, today if you measure my interferon, it might be high because I have a cold. And, and so accurate detection of the disease process that is leading to the symptom, it will be not only useful for patient management, but will inform a more accurate research. So that is the other two. Most important slide, this is the scleroderma program. The, uh, in, in Leeds, uh, it's been grown since Mike was here. Uh, Becky Ross at the top left is the one that is working now with, with, with Charlotte and, um, and uh, to progress the interferon score to a diagnostic. The clinical trial coordinators are in the, in, in the bottom. The clinical fellows doing the analysis are in the top, Enrico and Ranjita there. And this is the funding. And I don't know how much I went over time, but if you want any question, I'm here. Thank you.